Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining the next episode in this special six-part education series with our partner New Profit where we're talking about re-architecting the future through philanthropy and social entrepreneurship. Firstly I hope you and your loved ones are keeping well during what has and continues to be a challenging time for so many people. I'm Juliet Scott Croxford, CEO at Worth Media and I'm delighted to be joined by our special guest today Alex Bernadotte founder and CEO of Beyond 12, Jesus Herina, CEO of Family Independent Initiative, and Adrian Haro, CEO of The Workers' Lab, uh, along with our moderator for today, Dr. Angela Jackson at New Profit. Uh, she's a partner at New Profit and also the leader of New Profit's Future of Work Initiative. Welcome, everyone. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Our intention at Worth is to create conversations that help inspire and inform and activate our community, many of whom are investors, funders, entrepreneurs and leaders who want to leave a positive impact on the world and to help create a more positive, uh, inclusive and equal economy and society for the benefit of everyone. And we call that Worth Beyond Wealth. So we hope you enjoy this session and we hope you learn a lot from it. This education series is really about breakthrough impact. And philanthropy, like other sectors, is facing a moral reckoning on racial equality and continues to have a vital role to play in creating an America that lives up to the promise of its founding ideals. But we must overcome some of the barriers and bias that have existed in philanthropy for too long if we hope to unlock the ideas, the talent and the collaborations that we all think can drive towards a more equitable future. In this session today, we'll be discussing how we can use a new lens to see and invest in transformative change in work. Rearchitecting the future of work and workforce development is at a critical moment when millions of displaced and under underserved workers are facing systemic barriers to even providing for themselves and their families. There is a wave of transformative possibilities from reskilling to alternative post-secondary pathways and technological innovation to policy change that have started to take root. So we're delighted to be joined by social entrepreneurs and leaders, Alex Bernadotte, Jesus Serena, and Adrian uh, Harrow to share their perspectives on why now is the time to invest behind them to drive towards more equitable uh, economic opportunity. A few housekeeping rules before I hand over to Angela. This is a conversation. We would really do welcome comments and questions from you in the audience. Um, it's great to see so many of our community on here. If you use the chat function, please set it to all panelists and attendees and, and do share any comments or thoughts or questions you've got for the speakers and we'll weave that uh, into the conversation and come to those questions at the end of the session. Um, Without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Angela Jackson, partner at New Profit, uh, and also Angela currently leads New Profit's 15 million Future of Work Global Fund to invest in entrepreneurs and companies developing innovative technolo te technology solutions to upskill low-income and entry-level workers at scale. Angela also recently launched a 6 million Future of Work Grand Challenge powered by XPRIZE and MIT Solve to rapidly reskill 25,000 displaced workers into living wage jobs in the next 24 months. So Angela, it's great to see you again and thank you for being here and over to you. Julia, thank you so much. And just welcome to the Worth community. This has been such a pleasure partnering uh, between our two organizations to think about how philanthropy in this moment can make a change and can be different. And so I can't think of a more timely conversation. Um, as Juliet mentioned, um, Angela Jackson, I'm a partner at New Profit. As some of you know, New Profit has been around for 20 years and has a track record of investing in breakthrough entrepreneurs who are literally changing the world. And in this case, making for a more equitable future of work. Um, Juliet talked about our grand challenge. One thing that we're thinking about as we surface innovations and, and give away that $6 million, we wanna make sure that we're actually centering proximate leaders who are thinking about workers and, and centering worker values. For too long, we've had entrepreneurs developing innovations supposedly to help workers, but not working with them. And so our goal with this Future of Work Grand Challenge is really to shift the power dynamic and to think about how do we center workers in their lived realities 
And it's our hypothesis at New Profit by doing that, that we will have a more equitable future of work. We will create solutions that will work for everyone. In addition to doing this, we have our post-secondary initiative, which my colleague Sam will put in a link to, where we are beyond the fund, funding entrepreneurs who are innovating in the post-secondary space and thinking about how students learners go successfully from post-secondary to work. Um, so take a look at that because we are employer focused, we're learner focused, and most importantly, we're, we're outcomes focused. So today, as we shared, we're gonna hear from three extraordinary entrepreneurial leaders who are centering learners and centering workers in new ways. And I learn from them every time that I have a chance to talk to them and talk about their work. They inspire me for what I do. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll get started with a few questions. My colleague, Sam, is gonna drop their bios in the chat link, but I just wanna know more about them as people. And I want you all to have a chance to know more about them as people. So let's start with a few quick questions. The first one is, what is your fight song? And for me, I'll just share mine. Uh, when I get ready to, to kind of go to battle, especially in this moment, um, I've been thinking about Alicia Keys, this girl is on fire because you know it was like the future of work became the present of work. And like everything I do now, I have this like, I, I had it before, but I have intensely now this fight for workers who like this, this social network hasn't like worked for them in the past and we want it to work better for them. So Alex, tell me, what do, you, what do you listen to? What do you turn on to get jazzed up? So for me, thank you, first of all, Angela. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and Jesus and Adrian, looking forward to an amazing conversation today, always. Um, but my fight song is Survivor by Destiny's Child. So whenever I want to get myself, particularly in these moments, <laughs> when it just feels like, on some days, um, the world is coming down. I just blast that and remind myself that like, I'm, I'm a survivor. I'm not gonna stop. I'm not gonna give up, you know? I'm gonna keep going. So that's what I'm listening to these days to uh, pump myself up. Destiny's child. Hey, Zeus. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to go with Public Enemy, either Welcome to, to the Terror Dome or uh, Fight the Power. I just, I mean, from uh, being a teenager and being really angry about everything that was happening and sort of recognizing uh, hip hop music as an outlet uh, of being able to inspire, but also to think a little bit more critically, like it, it brings me back to that energy. Yeah, we talk a lot about proximate leaders. And I have to tell you, I, for me, some of our hip hop leaders were one of the, the most proximate at the time and bringing truth to power. So love it, fight the power. Adrian. Thanks, Angela, uh, and good morning. And thanks for having me here. I'm really uh, grateful and, and thrilled to be here. For me, um, I am and have always been a huge, huge, huge Jennifer Hudson fan. And in this time and always, my fight song has been a song off of her first album called I Got This. I don't know if anybody's heard that song, <laughs> but uh, the message is obvious and one that I uh, need every day, right? Particularly over the last six months. Um, so I've got it on repeat. I love it. Adrian, let, I think this is a good start. Let's talk about the last six months. Um, so we have a crowd of philanthropists here, social entrepreneurs. You know, for you, what has been the, la the, the most surprising thing in 2020, this last six months about philanthropy and about the work that you do? Yeah, it's a good question. I think for me, um, one of the things that was surprised me the most, um, but I was really grateful for was the fact that like uh, early to mid-March, um, most of our funders, a lot of the venture philanthropists that we work with, uh, really very quickly and proactively uh, offer to sort of convert uh, restricted grants into unrestricted money um, and made all that cash, they freed up all that cash in fairly short order. Um, and for anybody who raises money and it's their job to raise money, you know that getting unrestricted money is a little bit of a challenge, right? So the fact that philanthropy stepped up and did that uh, in the social sector, I think, um, was surprising, but also very, very, very helpful, at, particularly to smaller nonprofits, community-based organizations, for sure. Yep, and then Adrian, when you think about that restricted money, like why is restricted money so important? Can you articulate like <clears throat> what that means for an entrepreneur and an organization, especially in the, in the midst of a crisis and a pandemic? 
listen, if you have restricted money, it's terrific to have restricted money because you get to scale and bolster your programs very specifically. But unrestricted money really allows the organization to do a whatever thing, whatever it thinks it best serves its constituents or best serves its mission or charitable purpose or whatever. And certainly in a crisis, when you're trying to respond to new things literally every hour, uh, having that kind of flexibility is absolutely critical. And I think Jesus and Alex would probably agree with me on that point. Yeah, the plan goes out the window, right? That's right. Hey, Zeus, tell me, what did you find is like most surprising in, in 2020? Yeah, I, I think uh, to uh, build off of what Adrian said, uh, really the, the giving um, as people all of a sudden recognize that there was going to be a huge economic impact to the many who are already struggling inside of the current systems. Um, and as, as it built, so first that they came and acted and, and wanted to figure out a way to give immediately thinking that the, the federal government would act uh, in some sort of generous way or a reactive way. Um, and then as it hasn't really done anything comprehensive, um, continuing to think and, and adjust. And I think everything that Adrian just said that like, to connect back with us and, and check in and, and really lift lessons of what we are doing and how we are doing to be able to invest in those who are most impacted as well as understand our current position. And if there's any action that they can take to better support us, uh, lifting any restrictions on grants. I really, it's been pretty constant, the communication and, and making sure that they are um, really learning from us and the people that we're working with rather than reacting for the sake of it. And I, I think that that's been really important to our collaborators and our partners in this work. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I sit on the board of Beyond 12, full disclosure, before I go over to Alex. And I was talking to one of the students right after the pandemic hit. And she said that everything in her life changed, literally everything, school stopped, job ended. The only thing that continued was her connection to Beyond 12 because Beyond 12 is a technology first platform that connects students. And so she was able to still correspond with her, her coach and mentor. And so Alex, for you, I know a lot of things still change for the organization, but I'm, I'm just curious, what was surprising? Because I know what was surprising for me was that learner and saying the power of technology, right? To keep us connected when in this kind of disconnected moment. Um, yeah, Angela, and I'm going to apologize. Um, I think we're going to talk about these intersecting pandemics that we're in. And so in California, because of the fires, we're going through rolling power outages. And so my power just went out. So <laughs> I just want to say that I am here. Um, it's a little bit darker and I'm tethering um, the Wi-Fi connection. But if I go out, I apologize um, in advance. Um, but Angela, back to your question in terms of what's been most surprising. Um, Oh my goodness, what has been most surprising? And I cut out before you asked the original question, is it about philanthropy or what's been most surprising in this in general? About philanthropy and your work. Okay, um, so a couple of things, and I think picking up on the themes that Jesus um, and Adrian um, already said, I was surprised by how quickly we were able to deploy capital. Um, I think in times, you know, uh, before the pandemic, we didn't think it was possible, right? Like, I think that we thought that there were lots of hoops to jump through to be able to get dollars into the hands of the people who most need the, needed them as quickly as they, they needed them. But what surprised me was the fact that we were able to, for a moment, say, you know what, let's just let's just get the cash out. Let's just cut the checks. You know, let's make sure that we're getting money into the hands of workers without jumping through a lot of hoops. Um, and that was surprising to me. And then I, I have to say another thing that was surprising to me is how um, many in the field embraced and could even say the statement Black Lives Matter. I think before this moment, um, that sentence and that phrase seemed a little bit taboo and people were apologetic about being able to say it, but that um, I saw a lot of our partners even be able to say those words and be able to, you know, uh, make those statements to affirm the value of, uh, of lives, of Black lives, the value of, li of the lives of people of color was also very um, surprising. And then Alex, let's stick in with you when you say that was surprising. Can you tell me about a bit about your community, the Beyond 12 students? How has this impacted them? How has this, this 
racial rec reckoning impacted them and the pandemic, the environmental issues in California could go on and on and on. <laughs> I know we could go on and on and on. So let's say we started with the health pandemic, right? And um, obviously in March as a very real response to the health issues, um, we work with students who are in college, right? So um, students who have just transitioned or who are in the first couple of years of college, um, students of color, students from under-resourced communities. And so in March, the way that they were experiencing this with you know sudden campus closures was that they were just displaced. I mean, physically, emotionally displaced from um, their support structures, because for many of our students, their campus, even if they're living at home and they're commuting, isn't just a place to go get lectures. It is their primary source of stable housing, stable employment, stable food, um, safety and security, health care. And so when those, when they were cut off from their campuses originally, um, that was problematic and challenging. We surveyed um, at the very beginning of the pandemic some of the 97,000 students on our platform and ask them, what are your biggest concerns and how can we help? And one student responded and it was emblematic of a lot of, of the responses that were heartbreaking. I'm worried I won't be able to complete my coursework since I'm homeless now and I am trying to go to Starbucks to have access to Wi-Fi. So that is a quote that I just kept on my laptop to just keep me honest, to keep me grounded and to keep me it, keep our team centered right around our, our students experiences. Um, and so that was the initial response. And now what what students are experiencing is, um, again, because of these intersecting pandemics, many of our students have delayed their entrance to post secondary or simply dropped out, while others are scrambling to meet their basic needs to continue to meet, meet their basic needs in the midst of these campus closures, lost to jobs, health challenges. So because obviously the students that we um, work with are also on the front lines of the health pandemic. So either they themselves have, have um, have uh, contracted COVID or they know somebody who's really close to them who has. Um, and so they're struggling, you know, struggling to find technology access. And we're seeing from the data that that's having an impact, um, particularly on Black and, and Latinx students. The data are bleak. You know, new survey results from the Census Bureau confirmed that about 34% of Black households in which at least one adult had planned to enroll in higher education this fall canceled their plans. And that number is 32% for Latinx households. And so we're really concerned, obviously, that these drops in enrollment um, are going to erase decades worth of progress that we've made on college attainment and that these challenges are amounting to more than just a series of individual tragedies, right? I think these short-term drops in enrollment could eventually reverse decades of improvement in college attainment for under-resourced students and under-resourced communities. Uh, this is a great point. Um, I was stunned by this, the fact that they said since the pandemic started, 8 million families have slipped into poverty. That's about 56,000 each day. And Jesus, I know that you, your work is centered on family. Can you just tell us what you're seeing and hearing? Yeah, yeah no, similarly, I, I mean, I think that the, you know, for the, for those who are really struggling, um, that they're uh, first having to put their lives in danger by having to continue to do whatever work uh, they can continue to do during this time. And is uh, not only uh, are we uh, for Latinx and uh, African-Americans um, sort of being affected on the educational front, as Alex just mentioned, but also death rates are a lot higher because they're being put in a position where they can't really compromise um, to be able to sustain themselves and keep themselves from going hungry or paying their bills, et cetera. Um, it's really, uh, it, yeah, it's an, an emergency in that sense in their households and in their lives. Um, and, and the other part too that I would know is sort of in, in that sense, and I, I love Alex, your positioning is sort of how this impact, those who are already being impacted, right, by uh, systems of oppression is that what little gains they have been able to make, they're wiped out and now are running into the deficit. And I'm, I'm reminded of uh, a study that happened shortly after the last Great Recession, where it showed what the average uh, African-American household had lost versus the average white household. And it essentially, not only did they go back to zero, but they went into the negative. While most white households were able to keep a couple of hundred thousand dollars of net worth um, and then be able to rebound. And that essentially, right, it's 
really capulates, uh, captures, I'm sorry, the, the essence of what we're fighting against here, right? Like we're just trying to stay at break even uh, a lot of the times and for our communities. And if we are not investing, if we're not changing um, the way to bring um, value back inside of the communities who are working really hard to be able to sustain themselves and showing huge initiative, it's just that nobody else is recognizing that. Um, it's going to continue to happen. And I, I think that that's probably like from uh, that perspective in, in our communities, what we continue to hear is just where else can I find money, right? Like we've been doing um, a campaign specifically in COVID response dollars. We've been able to raise in the last seven months, a hundred million dollars for at a minimum one time, $500 payments. And you know, if you would have asked me that a year ago, I would have been like, that's amazing. That's incredible that we've been able to have that sort of impact. But what we know is we're just scratching the surface. It, it's really that the, the, the need is so great at this time. You know, it's uh, as, I, as I think about that need is so great. You know, a lot of us have talked about, you know, we have essential workers, m many of which you didn't choose to be essential in this moment, right? And for all of us who are lucky enough to be sheltered at home, you know, we're starting to realize we're only as safe as the least protected person that's around us, right? So I think a lot about, you know, the colleague who is like, you know, cutting my hair or someone who's, you know, cleaning the house or someone who's like bagging my groceries. And so when we're thinking about work and the future of work, like, Adrian, how are you thinking about like, how do we ensure that all people are protected? And so all jobs have like the dignity of a living wage and we haven't had that. And so we've seen the impact. So we'd love for you to talk about the impact and kind of what you see as like a forward vision um, as you do your work with the workers lab. Yeah, I think it's an important um, question, right? I've been thinking a lot about uh, by now, like the story about who's most impacted um, by this crisis is well documented, right? We know that it is black and brown people for sure uh, taking the hardest hit here. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about um, like uh, that saying about hitting rock bottom that sometimes you need to hit rock bottom to whatever that saying is. <laughs> and so like it is tragic and terrible what's happening right now, right? Uh, particularly for essential workers and their communities. Uh, but it is the job of the workers lab um, as an innovation organization, as, a, as an organization whose purpose is hinges on new ideas and giving new ideas life about increasing power for workers, really to highlight the hope. And I know that sounds a little corny, right? But it is true uh, as an intermediary funder um, that our purpose becomes even more urgent, right? You think about what has happened um, right now for workers uh, and how woefully unprepared uh, we were as a country uh, for this moment, virtually on every front, right? Everything from sick leave uh, to the infrastructure and administrating unemployment insurance. Uh, Alex talked about the education system, the transportation rails, all of it, right? And so there is a, there is a massive opportunity in this tragedy to really find the bright spots where public sector leaders, private sector leaders in some communities, particularly indigenous communities, were workers themselves uh, in the absence of a robust federal response yeah. are fighting for their lives, right? Um, and so when we think about the future of work, for us, like the future of work looks a lot like the present of work. We know from BLS data that the lion's share of job growth in the future will be in home and healthcare, right? In restaurant and retail and other service jobs, right? And so that's why I get a little uh, frustrated. I struggle that, with the fact that like the future of work conversation is often dominated by automation uh, and robots because we know that the, the future of work as we know it will be uh, is in low wage, low protection jobs held mostly by people of color and uh, women of color, especially. Right, so we need to be planning for that future. I think, Angela, um, as far as I'm concerned, every conversation we have about the future of work should be focused on creating good jobs, creating training programs, redesigning the social safety net uh, to meet workers in that future, right? Um, and certainly that's how we think about innovation uh, and the ideas that we fund in our funding strategy inside the workers lab. 
I love that. Um, and a lot of folks are talking about the shifts that are happening because of the pandemic. And Alex and I had a conversation and Alex, you said, I said, you know, what are going to be these large changes? And you're like, there's an opportunity for large changes but <laughs> you said, but, and can you, can you tell me a little bit more about what you see, what you're thinking when you say, but what's the cautionary tale here? No, absolutely. Um, Angela, the cautionary tale is, um, although we've never been in this kind of unique moment with, you know, the four intersecting pandemics as we we've liked to call them, we have been down this road before, right? Um, and I am going to date myself, but I remember marching and protesting in college when we saw the Rodney King verdict, right? Like, and when we saw the video of Rodney King being beaten. So this kind of reckoning where we recognize that um, certain members of our society are disproportionately impacted, right? By some of these systems has happened um, throughout the course of our history before. So I am excited. And as I mentioned, when you asked me about what surprised me, I am excited that we've um, made statements. You know, I think we've sort of gone a lot further than we've had in the past, but I am worried that we're going to keep it at statements rather than doing the hard work. It feels like the gravitational pull back to normal is very, very strong. And I hear lots of institutions talking about, we can't wait to go back to normal, right? Like when will we be able to, when we'll be able to open campuses um, in the work that I do specifically. And I worry, right? That our attention span is going to wane um, as things continue to be difficult so that our goal is going to be normal rather than transformation, right? That our goal is going to be, we have a picture and an idea of what pre you know, pandemics was and that we are designing or redesigning for that rather than using this moment as an opportunity to completely revamp these systems that we know. Normal was inadequate, insufficient uh, for so many uh, um, in our society. And I just worry that that, that gravitational pull to normal is, is, is stronger than our will for change. Yeah. And as it relates to philanthropy, Adrian mentioned part of that normal before was this kind of grants, restricted versus unrestricted. We also know that leaders of color disproportionately receive uh, less funding. Jesus, I'm curious to you, curious to hear from you, what needs to shift, right, in this new normal to be very different than what we've experienced in the past as it relates to philanthropy? Yeah, I, I think a number of things that there's a huge opportunity. Um, I really love the framing of, of starting to think, given the lessons learned, how to, and also the pandemic uh, or the multiple pandemics that we're facing, how to make sure um, that uh, these systems have, uh, that already were negatively affecting so many, how do we ensure that we don't go back, that there isn't this, uh, to Alex's point, a new normal. Um, and so uh, actually, uh, as you mentioned that, uh, Angela, one of the things that I thought about was new profit stat that uh, I, one of the gatherings I, I heard a couple of years ago, which is that 97, 98% of all philanthropy goes to white led organizations. Right? That means that Adrian, Alex and I are fighting for a very small piece of the, the total pie that exists inside of um, the sector. And, and it also means that there are so many more like us who are being innovative and creating impact that are ignored. Um, and so a, a couple of things that I would say first is how are, how is philanthropy tracking that for themselves? How do you grade yourself against that stat? Um, and can you create transparency and be able to share what percentage of your grants is going to um, organizations that are led by people of color and the, the communities that you're targeting versus those who are um, representative of, of white led organizations and sort of that shift and, and really understanding and connecting back to community. And I think that that's the second piece that I would center is in our work, we recognize at all times that the solutions oftentimes are being created already. They exist inside of the communities that we work with that people in spite of all the challenges that we can talk about are still making it work on a day-to-day -day basis. 
how are we looking for that, those solutions? How are we investing in them? And how are we amplifying them? Because ultimately, there's not going to be a silver, a silver bullet in, in sort of uh, inside of any of our cities or, or communities for that matter. Um, but what we know is that the people themselves have to carry this forward. And whether it's the Black Lives Movement right now or other movements in history, it's always been the answer. And I, I think that there's a great opportunity to shift the thinking as to what can we do to how can we support? Yeah, my colleague Tulane Montgomery, who kicked off this um, session, she always says the point, you know, proximity is expertise. And so how do we begin looking at the people that we're serving as the experts, right, of their own lives? Um, we just wrote about um, a piece on that in the Social Stanford Innovation Review um, that says effective change requires proximate leaders. Uh, Sam will drop a link to that, to that article in there, but when I think about proximate leaders and, and standing them up, Adrian, I think about the work of the workers lab and, and the money, the innovation money that you put in the hands of proximate people to, to solve problems um, and also to learn. Can you, can you share a bit more about what that looks like and, and what it takes to trust people who are proximate to solve their own problems? Sure, yeah, and I wanna affirm a point that Jesus just made about uh, really leaning on the expertise of people in communities. And in our case, because uh, I think it's a point, trusting workers, uh, framing them as experts in their own right, I think is a point that often gets glossed over. You know, my predecessor in this job, our founder used to say that uh, working people were geniuses, right? Given what they had to navigate, all the systems that they had to navigate, which are so hard, right? And uh, that that made them uh, geniuses. And I couldn't agree uh, with that more, and we should be tapping into that, right? And I think as a, to get to your question, Angela, as a, as a leader or a person in power, you really just need to make a choice that you are going to do everything you can to be proximate to the people you say you serve, and then do the work, really, to get as close as you can to their lives. Uh, for us at the Workers Lab, that starts with who we are as a team, right? We are very proudly a majority first generation uh, queer person of color team. Uh, most of us grew up and were raised by the workers uh, we're trying to help, right? Um, and so while that sounds like super cool and awesome, it, it's really important for two reasons, I think. Uh, the first is it disrupts assumptions about who's best equipped to do innovation, right? Um, to solve problems, to offer insights, to drive progress, right? And, and second, and perhaps most importantly, it informs our grant making where we actively seek out and support leaders, innovators, and organizations overwhelmingly staffed and led by people of color. And we're unabashed about that because of their proximity to workers at the margins, right? The vast majority of people who apply to us for money uh, are not just people of color, but overwhelmingly women leaders of color. It's 86% of our funding. Um, and it turns out, Angela, that uh, innovators aren't only tech bros in the Silicon Valley, right? Uh, but very much farm workers in rural Ohio, uh, formerly incarcerated firefighters in California and everything in between, right? And, and I feel really proud to do this work because I think the Workers Lab is one of the few places, arguably the only place, where innovators like these can come with a new idea about increasing worker power, uh, where they can come to get highly flexible dollars just to try something. Uh, just to take a risk, which I think is so important in our communities. And so giving these folks money to make their dreams come true is the best part of my job. And I, I'm really proud of that. I, I'm leaving here with working people are geniuses. I know, and I think all of us who are at home, who are homeschooling, working at night around the clock, like we, we feel that now, right? The fact that they've been able to persevere and even thrive in the face of this. Um, I'm gonna get that like printed. I am, I'm thinking about as we are, you know, halfway through this, this conversation, really about what advice, if you're thinking about funders, you know, Adrian, I just wanna pick up where you left off and you talked about like, that's the part of your life, giving people money to take risk, changing the face of who can be an innovator. When you think about other philanthropists that are on the phone, if you could recommend or advise in terms of practices, how did you get to the place where you thought we can invest in these workers and, 
and give them the money and just trust that they're going to make the best decisions with it. Yeah, I think it goes back to uh, your values, right? Um, I think, you know, you got to take the risk to, to succeed or fail, right? You got to start somewhere. And I have to tell you, know, I've been, I've been at the Workers Lab since 2017, which is, uh, it didn't start until like, it started just a little bit before that. Um, and every year, every time we put out a call for applications, um, they get better, the pot gets bigger, um, we're proving out impact more. Um, and so in terms of recommendations, like I said, you just have to make the decision. You have to take a chance on people who look like all of us on this call. Um, mostly because of our lived experiences, right? You have to ask the right questions, but you really lean on the lived experiences of the people on the ground. And I would say as far as recommendation, like follow the data on job growth, like I said earlier, you know, I, I, the data, if the data tells us that the future of work is in service jobs, then as funders, we should be strategizing now for that future. And if you're not thinking about funding in the work, uh, the worker health and safety space, uh, uh, I would encourage you to think again. Um, you know, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, it was clear to us we had data um, that the areas of worker of worker safety and health uh, were lacking focus, prioritization, certainly investment. Um, and so we designed an entire program around it. Um, mostly because like most folks don't even have a frame for worker health and safety anymore, right? Uh, there was a time in this country where folks talked about OSHA and knew what OSHA was, and now it has become sort of the sleeping giant of our federal government. Um, and even in COVID, right, people are confused by worker safety and health. Uh, what does it mean for a worker to actually be safe and healthy? To us, it means that like that's the first step, right? If you don't feel well, you can't go to work, which means you can't make money, mobility isn't an option, uh, you can't vote and participate in our democracy worker safety and health has always been the first step and is so critical. But when you look at where the funding goes and you look at where the focus are and where our priorities are, they're off. So, and the pandemic of course has given even more clarity to that point, right? And so I would just encourage everybody if you haven't already to revisit your funding strategies to make sure that they match the reality of where workers are and where they're gonna be and surround yourself with people and organizations and partners who wake up every day thinking and talking about workers and listen to them. Yeah, I love that. And Alex, you know, sometimes funders, we are um, accused of being risk averse, but maybe that's not always true. And so I'd just love to hear from you, like any, your call to action or thoughts that you have. Yeah, and I think it's picking up on what Adrian says. I think there needs to be a mindset shift, right? Because I don't think that funders are risk averse. I think that they are, they see investments in organizations led by people who look like us as risky. Um, and I think, you know, I encourage funders to examine, you know, what makes an investment in any one of our three organizations or any other organizations um, feel more risky, you know what I mean, than it is. Um, than an investment in other organizations. What are the underlying biases or assumptions um, that you're making? You know, I think we talk about pattern recognition as being a skill, and I think it is an important skill, and we all use it when we make um, decisions, all kinds of decisions, but particularly when we talk about investment and in philanthropy, um, if the patterns, you know, the assumptions on which the patterns are based were originally biased, right? Then the data, right? Like are skewed when you are going to try to apply them to an investment, particularly when you try to assess risk. So I think for me, I don't think that philanthropy is necessarily risk averse. I think that there are certain individuals who are considered risky. Um, and I would just challenge, you know, challenge folks to, to, to think about those assumptions. Um, also picking up on something else that, that um, Adrian said in terms of surrounding yourself, right? So does your organization reflect the future of work that you want to see? We all sort of understand that the future of work is diverse. Um, does your organization reflect that? You know, so um, we often talk about people wanting to get proximate. You yourself don't have to necessarily get proximate, but can you hire people who are proximate, who can make better decisions then um, about investments that, that reflect your, your values? Um, when you are potentially 
convening? Do you think about who is on your panels, who you're inviting to the table, who is coming? Um, do you push your colleagues um, when you're invited to a conference or to sit on a panel and say, hey, you know what, like this does not reflect um, the diversity of voices or experiences that I think will make for a rich and more meaningful dialogue. When you're making room at the table, are you only making room for one diverse voice, right? Like one diverse voice is not, um, does not inclusivity, equity, and diversity make. So can you make room for four people, <laughs> right? Like four diverse voices when you're thinking about hiring. So I really is just picking up on the themes that, uh, that Adrian was talking about. Like, I think there has to be a, a significant tectonic shift um, in mindsets. Um, and lastly, I would say, you know, speaking to philanthropy directly, this other concept of the warm welcome, right? And so that we tend to sort of have, um, limited circles and so therefore we are introduced right to organizations within those circles have you created a space where anyone you know can 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 set up a meeting with you have you created the structure or the infrastructure where an entrepreneur has a good idea and is able to get in at the table without um having that person be introduced to you by somebody already within your network. So I think there are lots of ways, but really what it comes down to is a shift in values and a shift in mindset. Sure. I mean, I think it's like in the like period, in the, in the point, um, a lot of things that we're thinking about new profit as it relates to that is, I just wanna just add to your statement, it's not even about just hiring diverse people, but like also putting them in positions that they can make decisions, right? And make sure that we're including them. And I think that's what this moment is also calling for, a shift on how we see our diverse colleagues, right? Not enough to have them in the room, but we need to have them at the table and actually have their voice heard and acted upon. Um, Jesus, I'm gonna turn to you for final words. And thoughts. I know you're shaking your head. I was going to say, ditto to everything that you all just uh, mentioned. I absolutely uh, love the comments. I, I, I think just to build on a couple of quick things. So Alex's statement around the narrative that we've built. Um, and I would even push that further and say, as we think about communities of colors in this country, we have built a system that is constructed specifically about what they lack, what they need, um, and all of the racist and negative stereotypes that have evolved over the decades and if not centuries. Um, and as a result of that, it is very much when we come into, uh, I'm sorry, when philanthropy oftentimes comes into that space, uh, again, how can we act because we are built this very strong storyline that they are needy, helpless and stuck. And it's our job to help them. And for, you know, as uh, the Family Independence Initiative for the last 20 years, we've been screaming, they're not stuck. <laughs> they're not helpless. Uh, they have huge initiative. And if you recognize their community and, and that initiative and invest in it, you're going to be in a much better place. And I think that Adrian and Alex have been uh, alongside us screaming that that recognition is really critical and that shift in power uh, is important to that narrative change. And I think that the second piece to that is if you, for for us, is really critical to recognize that space and, and that huge industry. I mean, we quantify it at $400 billion a year. And so how are you driving away from it? How are you bringing others along to participate? Because there's two roles that philanthropy can really play, both in supporting the actors who are helping build a new system of recognition and support proximity and investment, but then also they can bring others along because we know that philanthropy follows one another. Um, and, and I just, I'm reminded actually, uh, Mark Gunther who writes on Medium and I'll put up the, on, on, uh, on the chat here, the article I think that just came out today or yesterday around who rules uh, philanthropy? Who's on your boards? What sort of diversity and, and what sort of voice and recognition and power are you giving? And I, I think it builds on a lot of what we have been saying. So I'll, uh, I'll, 
I get excited by this conversation, but I'll stop there. No, I, I'm the same way. Um, you know, when I joined New Profit two years ago, I really came with a point of view is like how the future of work is funded. Like we're deciding that real time, right? We're deciding if it's going to be more equitable or more inequitable. And every decision matters. Every dollar that we invest is taking us to a normal that we want to participate in. So, you know, it, it's those big and small decisions bets that we're placing, people that we're inviting to the table. And I am just so thrilled that we were able to, to have this conversation uh, with us, the five of us today. I think what we'll do now is Juliet is coming back on board. She has a few questions. And I would just invite people who are listening, put your questions in the chat box right now, and we're going to, to tackle some of those. So I will take a look at the chat while Juliet is coming back. And, and Jesus, thank you for putting in that medium piece. So the first question that's popping up there, and Julia, you're back with us, so excellent. Hi, that was a great conversation, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, did, you, did, a, did you say there was a question that you had that popped up there, Angela? I was, no, I was just starting to look at um, the chat right now. So one of the questions that came through was, how do we stop the gravitational, uh, gravitational pull to back to the old ways? Like, how do we stop that? What are some things that we can do? I mean, I'll, I'm happy to start um, there and I'll talk about just education in general. And this is a theme that we've heard about proximity. But for me, when I think about education, it's student voice, right? So we believe that because historically underrepresented students are in close proximity to the educational equity challenge, that they are best suited to design its solutions. So as we're thinking about redesign, we need to enlist students as co-creators and co-designers, not a constituent group to be surveyed or to be consulted, but right, actually sitting at the table um, with power to help design what higher education is going to look like in the future and what K-12 is going to look like in the future. So I'm hearing a lot of conversations, seeing a lot of panels, seeing a lot of discussions about the future of ed. Um, and most of those conversations do not include student voice. And so one very practical way for us to do that is as we're doing our reimagining and re-envisioning is to have our constituents and stakeholders um, as powerful people sitting at the table with us to help us envision as architects, right, of, uh, and designers of these new systems. Um, so that for me feels like a practical thing. We're missing constituent voice in all of these conversations about redesigning these systems. Excellent. I have another question here, Angela, which was, um, what are the actions we can take in the next six months to help enact change? Love to hear everyone's thoughts on that. I mean, I'll build off a little bit of what Alex just said. I, I think if your philanthropy prior to this pandemic uh, wasn't recognizing sort of the what already were cracks in these systems that have just right created uh, just uh, huge holes <laughs> inside of our society at this time and expose them. Um, it, it's a good time to say, now that we recognize this, what does that mean for us and what we're trying to do? And I think bringing that proximity into um, play is going to be important as well as our articulating a clear set of values. Um, I, I really love that uh, from Adrian, that, that you are really clear as to, from, from that values perspective, what you're trying to achieve and, and work in, um, whether it's around the racial equity component and promoting uh, strong leadership inside of the community. Uh, we think about impact and really uh, being able to do small actions that could really live, uh, lead to systems change um, and, uh, and, and collaboration that this isn't for us, like there's no way we're gonna get to do this alone. Uh, that we really need to lean on one another and support one another in this work. And so I think for, for any organization at this time to be really clear on both of those, it's gonna be really important. Yeah, and I would just add, 
you know, there's power in learning communities. And at New Profit, we've been convening um, communities of philanthropists, of funders around issues. I think it's gonna be really important to be, to your point, transparent about your values, but also sharing that with your peers and also transparent about where the bumps are, right? And what you need to learn because we're all learning. No one's gonna get this perfect out the gate, um, which is why we build these communities. And it's important to have people who are next to you who are learning beside you, also holding you accountable. And I think the last thing I'd say, back in February, pre-pandemic, uh, we put together a list of like 100 leading social entrepreneurs who are poised for growth. Some of them are working already at scale. If you're thinking about, and across all type of issues, if you're thinking of supporting new issues, like Adrian said, around worker health and safety, which I think is essential, like we, that's like, you have to start there, or, you know, financial literacy or climate, check with us, because we can, again, refer uh, social entrepreneurs to you if you're thinking about investing or thinking about adding them to your leadership team, your staff, or having them sit on your board. You know, we're going to do this through community by sharing names, by getting proximate, but most of all, we're going to do it in community. I loved what I think Alex shared as well, which is like, oh, is your organization reflecting the values that you stand for? And, and, and really thinking about, you know, it, it's not just bringing one diverse person in but actually thinking about how you're hiring and how you're doing your panels I just thought that that was just really helpful practical advice as well um, I think we've got time for one more question and, and I think I'd love to hear from all, all of you briefly on although the last six to eight months has been incredibly challenging what have been the bright spots and what gives you hope um, and inspires you for the future Alex do you want to go first yeah, um, I work with young people and so they give me hope, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, I mean, this generation, you know, of, of young people who are out marching and being unapologetic about the kind of future that they want and that they demand um, from us who are um, speaking truth to power, right, who are holding us accountable um, is just it's a beauty to behold and to, and to watch. And so I go in and I have the honor every day of being able to be connected to young folks who I'm like, okay, we're gonna be okay. You know, like I think things are hard right now, but with the future in your hands, I have a lot of hope. They understand intersectionality in a way that we, you know, I am going to speak for myself that I don't think my generation, you know, understands. And so, both in terms of you know the reflection of the students that we're working with but our young staff who many um, of them are two or three years out of college um, who are working with us they keep us accountable they keep us grounded you know <laughs> like they yeah. are clear about the vision for the future that they want to see um, and they do it with joy you know so i am inspired because i get to be surrounded um, by these young folks who i know are having um are gonna have an outsized impact as we think about the systems that are more just and more equitable. Thanks, Alex. Adrian? Yeah, I think it's a good question, Juliet. Um, I, th what's giving me a lot of hope right now is a, is a fairly new group we're, we're funding. They're an innovator, our grant team of ours right now. They're called the Forestry and Fire Recruitment Program. Everybody should look them up, they're awesome. Um, they are a Black-led organization uh, that is creating an entirely new industry for formerly incarcerated firefighters. Uh, if anybody's familiar with this issue, particularly in California, there are these things called fire camps, which are essentially uh, currently incarcerated folks are trained up in the same way a non-incarcerated person would be to, be to be a firefighter. The problem, which is great, right? But the problem is once they get out, uh, the opportunities to become a firefighter uh, are nil to none, right? And so uh, this group uh, is creating this, building this industry centered around racial justice, centered around good jobs, uh, centered around like a mobility ladder. Um, there's a really interesting sort of social enterprise piece where they're building out a business model for vendors. I just think it's packed with new ideas and innovation and I am so happy that I that we're supporting them. And I think that goes, I'll be quick, Julia. I think that this yeah. point 
and this grantee actually goes to a lot of what Alex and Jesus were saying about, you know, when their application came through to us for funding, I knew immediately that I was going to fund it um, because uh, because of who I am. So I have a brother that's currently locked up right now doing 25 to life, right? Um, it's part of my story. So when I saw this application, I knew I was going to give it funding right away and I did. And I think that gets back to the proximity point. Like that's why investing in Jesus and Alex and me and Angela is so important, right? That's part of my story. Uh, and it's how I'm going to fund, right? Um, and so it's, that's why it's so important to continue to invest in us, right? And to continue to give us money because we know where it's going to make the impact, right? And so uh, I would just loop that back and say like, that is to me, like the, one of the great examples about proximity, it really informs uh, the framing around your funding, the strategy, and of course, the leaders that you give money to, which are often uh, not the folks you see um, or think of when you think about innovation. Thanks, Adrian. That's so powerful. And, and Sam has actually just shared the link to the forestry, uh, forestry fire and recruitment program, which you just mentioned. So, so thank you for that and good luck with it. And, and Jesus, what, what, what gives you hope for the future? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not very different than what you already heard. First, I think, the, yeah, the, being able to continue to see people marching, uh, the young people who are so well organized and driving um, in every city in this country, this point home, that things have to change. Um, I know as an old guy that <laughs> already marched at one time, but uh, looked to try to bring my kids along and do, right? And I'm like, trying to get out there, but God, the resiliency um, and consistency is really inspiring in all sorts of ways. And and yeah, it, it gives me comfort to know that they got this, right? Like, uh, and that we're gonna be pushed as a result of that. And we need to continue to find uh, ways to, to get close to it and to learn from it. Um, it it's just quite impressive. And I, and I think whether it's here, whether it's on, you know, uh, things that I watch or read, as I just mentioned, Mark Gunther's article, that's one uh, point. It's, it's pretty incredible. We've been having these conversations for quite some time, right? Like I've been in the nonprofit sector for over 20 years. This is a new, right? Like for us, uh, our challenges as people of color uh, in, in this sector, um, our challenges around the under, or I'm sorry, overlooking our communities and the value that they bring and, and a lot of the conversation that we've had, but the fact that there is a, now a consistent line of conversation where we're putting this focus, it gives me hope that I, I believe that we can really uh, think about what tomorrow could look like together. Thank you, Jesus. And Angela, uh, help us bring it to a close. What, what bright spots do you see? and What gives you hope? Yeah, it's, it's building on what Jesus just said. I call it the Corona bonus, this global timeout of sorts, right? Where we were all sitting, watching, you know, the same news, seeing the same things. It, again, it was nothing new, right? This, this lack of a safety net, but now we've all watched it. And it's, what gives me hope is I just think our humanity will not allow us to like unsee that, right? That we will have to individually build move to act differently because we know that if we don't right we could go back to that normal that was not normal for just anyone so that that corona bonus absolutely gives me hope that we've had time to think and reflect wow this was such a brilliant conversation and alex adrian and Hesse, thank you so much for such a, a thought-provoking discussion um I, I thought some of the points around risk and some of the practical points you shared were were fascinating. Um, and a huge thank you to you, Angela, for brilliantly moderating the session once again. Um, and a special thank you to New Profit, Sam, Sarah, Lizzie, and the team for being our, our partner for this series. Most importantly, thanks to all of you that joined us today and for your great questions. We hope you enjoyed it um, and, and we hope you learned something. Please do share any feedback with us. We'd love to hear your comments and any other topics you'd like us to cover. In future series, you can email us at community at worth.com. Um, you can also register for all the sessions in this series online at worth.com forward slash events and join us for the next session of this series on Wednesday, November 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, where we'll be talking about using a new lens to see and invest in transformative change in democracy with some great special guests. Um, later on today on Worth Live, we also at 3 p.m. have the next installment of the Lonely CEO talking about how leaders are tackling the issues of diversity, inclusion and equality. 
uh, with, with Kate Luzio from the Luminary and, and a, a great lineup of, of speakers. Also Thursday, join us for the next normal series on how women can boost their financial confidence right now with special guest Cece Elisa, co-founder at the Curvy Con and uh, Kathleen Entwistle, Private Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Please register online for this uh, at worth.com forward slash events um, and read our content and sign up for our newsletter. In the meantime, thank you once again, um, speakers, and uh, be kind, stay healthy, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.